worship service during this season as we prepare for Christmas. And I like to, uh, I'd like to have Chuck explain it to you. I don't know if you know Chuck, but Chuck has taught me a lot over the years um, and some of our youth because uh, I will use uh, Chuck. Chuck knows church. Uh, this is something from the United Methodist Church. He's going to explain to us the Advent wreath if you've been wondering about what's the deal with an Advent wreath uh, after all. Listen to Chuck knows church. The season of Advent always includes the four Sundays before Christmas. It's a time of waiting as we prepare our hearts and lives for the coming of the Christ child. And using the Advent wreath and its candles is a way that many are celebrating Advent at church and in the home. Now there are usually four purple or blue candles on a circular wreath showing the four weeks of Advent with a white candle right at the center called the Christ candle. Now often families or members of the congregation help mark the four Sundays of Advent by lighting the candles. Look at that. You know, I remember my parents always let my older brother help light the candles, but uh, I never got the chance to. Might have had something to do with The Towering Inferno being my favorite movie. Anyway, on the first Sunday, lighting the first purple candle signifies hope, because Advent is a time of waiting and hoping. On the second Sunday, the first candle is relit, followed by a second purple candle, the candle of love. On the third Sunday of Advent, after the first two purple candles, the third candle lit is sometimes pink instead, signifying joy. And on the fourth Sunday, we light the candle of peace. Now there can be scriptures or words spoken reflecting each of the Advent messages, you know, hope, love, joy, peace. Yeah, so Chuck's help us out there with, uh, with what this Sunday is. This is the Joy Sunday in our Advent uh, preparation for Christmas. Um, on this Advent Sunday of Joy, we continue our Advent worship series in which we've been uh, exploring home, coming home together, and what that looks like. We've talked about the meaning of home for each of us um, and concluding that uh, home was a place where we meet. Home is, is where we meet God. A home can be a place where we meet a welcome for, for one another and we find a welcome there. Um, a home is a place where steadfast love and faithfulness line up and meet, where righteousness and peace kiss each other. We learned last week in our scripture reading from, from the Psalms. This week we hear from the Apostle Paul and uh, his writing to the first letter that he wrote, um, the Thessalonians, which is actually, by the way, the oldest writing in the New Testament, is, uh, is this letter from Paul to his, his friends in Thessalonia. And, uh, and we learn in this letter something about joy, uh, an expression of joy that Paul expresses to them. Listen with me for the word of God found here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Thanks be to God for this reading of Holy Scripture. Well, here's the, the first line, rejoice always. You know, right there, I kind of hesitate. I mean, always? Can you, really? Is that, uh, is that possible? Is it possible for us to rejoice always? Sure, we can agree that uh, when you're getting together with family in the home place, there are times of joyous uh, experience there. We can rejoice uh, in those uh, reunions of folks during the holiday season. Um, our team winning the big game, sure, we're going to rejoice at such a thing. I've, I've seen some of you at, uh, at some of the games, and yeah, you can rejoice. I've seen it. It's, uh, it's possible. Um, but always, is that really the right pairing of words that, uh, that Paul should have chosen there? Rejoice 
always, in all circumstances? Is that even possible? What is joy after all? How is it possible to rejoice always? Does it come from something we have or something we do? Is that the way that we find joy? Is it a pleasure? Is it uh, something that uh, is elusive? Is it fleeting? Is it permanent? Can it be there in all circumstances? Is it something that we can always enjoy to have and rejoice always? When my search in the New Testament, I found that there are over 60 times that joy is mentioned in the New Testament alone. I won't outline all of them for you. We've got, you know, things to do, people to see. But um, just let me highlight a few of those where we find joy encountered in Scripture. Of course, the, the First Thessalonians passage here speaks of joy and rejoicing always. Um, in Philippians uh, 4, there's another location, uh, almost exactly the same words. Paul writing again here to another group of people. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice just to give it another you know, bonus, he pushes for it once again. So rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. There's another place in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. The Apostle Paul and his mentor Barnabas are sharing the good news of Christ uh, with the Gentiles, those who have um, not known God in, in the way that, uh, that they have. And so they, they're driven out of Antioch because people don't want to hear their message. And this is what we find. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Filled with joy as they're kicked out of town. Go figure. That's, a, that's kind of an interesting location for joy to show up. Uh, kicked out of Antioch and, uh, and they're in joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Finally, let me point out in the Gospel of Luke, um, in the Christmas story, shepherds are in their fields uh, keeping their watch over the flocks by night and the angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. So right there in our Christmas story, great joy is found. In his book, Talking to Ducks, which I love that title, Talking to Ducks, James Kitchen explains that there are two major types of joy. And maybe this is why we understand how you can rejoice always is because there's a difference in the way joy can be expressed or how it can come upon us. There's internal joy and external joy. Internal joy comes from within, of course, and external joy comes from the outside. It's something that's a part of our environment that comes upon us and then we're joyous because that happening occurred in our midst. Uh, that's an external source of joy. When the circumstances change, joy uh, dries up. But there's that moment, that experience, the winning team kind of experience, and joy shows up because of that moment. You're in the environment and it's externally kind of placed upon you because you're rejoicing in that moment. Joy that lasts, though, joy that is always rejoicing, always, as Paul describes it, a joy that lasts is something that is internal, an internal source this joy is more than just giddy happiness. It's, uh, it's something deeper and richer. Um, it's, uh, it's not ignorant of tragedy and difficulty. It is grounded, though, in a profound awareness of both joys and sorrow of life. Internal joy. So in Thessalonians and in Philippians, where Paul speaks of rejoicing always, rejoicing is something that is talked about in an internal sense, not an external experience of joy. It's not, I've got a wonderful feeling, everything's going to go my way kind of joy. It's, a, it's a, a deeper kind of understanding of what joy might mean for us. Karl Barth, the great theologian of the 20th century, probed deeply into the human experience and he said, joy in this world is always in spite of something. He then went on to say that it is a defiant nevertheless. An internal joy is a defiant nevertheless. Even in the midst of a difficult circumstance, we can find joy to be a part of our lives. So the Bible doesn't say to rejoice in circumstances. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord, as Paul puts it in Philippians. Joy that last is an externally dependent. It's not dependent on the absence of pain and sorrow either. There's an internal source for joy that we can 
connect with, and tap into. Joy that last is rooted and grounded in the God of Jesus Christ for us as followers of Christ. I've been reading the book of joy, um, which, you know, seems like an appropriate thing for a preparation for a sermon like this, but actually I received it on my birthday, uh, a gift to me from my wife Karen, and, uh, and the book of joy um, is a, a conversation um, for a week that Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu had at the occasion of the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday. They gathered together um, in uh, the Dalai Lama's home place and, uh, and they spent a week together and, and there was another uh, co-writer with them that, uh, that wrote about their experience and then he titled the book, The Book of Joy. Uh, it's an interesting read and uh, it's been uh, very helpful for me to understand this concept of joy and, and where it uh, might come from and how we might rejoice always. What does that look like and how does it happen? The Dalai Lama describes a Buddhist um, understanding of joy that is called muditu. Mudita, that would be it, mudita. And uh, it's, it's sympathetic joy is the way that he describes it. Um, it's a way of overcoming envy. So important is this, uh, this pursuit in the Buddhist faith, um, the Tibetan Buddhist faith, that it's one of the, the four qualities that is to be cultivated, that is something that Buddhists are to, to uh, work on, to grow deeper in understanding of this mudita. And, and so that is over and against and in contrast, described in this book, to another word that's a German word, um, schadenfreude which I'm hoping I'm getting that one right. Schadenfreude is an interesting kind of um, counterbalance to Mudita. Schadenfreude is, uh, is taking joy, having joy, because somebody else has failed. Y you know that feeling, right? When you're, you're glad that you're, you know, the, the so-and-so finally got it at the end of the movie. That, that kind of joy that comes, that's a different source of joy, um, possibly external, but it's also uh, something about taking uh, delight in someone else's failing and finding joy in that. So joy has some really strange sources, doesn't it? Schadenfreude is not uh, the kind of joy that we want to pursue, but this understanding that the Dalai Lama brings up and that Archbishop uh, Tutu showed and talked about in their book uh, is, is connected with compassion. This mudita, this, this, uh, this finding sympathy and connection with another is a way of finding joy that is connected with compassion. In fact, their book could have been called something around uh, encouraging compassion because that's what they talk about the most when they talk about joy. How do you have compassion for others? In fact, they believe that, uh, that we're hardwired, we're connected. Both uh, Tutu and, and Dalai Lama believe that we're connected as human beings to care for others. Um, we just need to cultivate that more. We need to help that grow within us and in our humanity. Um, we can, can do that. Now, in our um, Surviving the Holidays workshop that I've been leading, there's another one that's going to be this uh, next Tuesday evening, um, I learned that, uh, that one of the ways to overcome grief is to do exactly what the Dalai Lama and Tutu were suggesting, that you cultivate compassion for others. It's a way to deal with our, our grief uh, during the holidays, is to, uh, to find some way to, to help others, to reach out, to show compassion for others, and take the focus off of ourselves for that moment. When we help others, we often experience what has been called the helper's high. That must be what uh, Mudita is really connected with. The helper's high, our endorphins, uh, are released in our brain. Um, it's the same reward center that shows up when you think about chocolate. I mean, if you like chocolate. If you like chocolate, you'll have the exact same kind of reaction to, uh, to helping others that you would to, uh, to a dessert that, uh, that really, you know, makes you happy and joyous. Um, that's the same connection that goes on in the brain. So I was thinking about all this, reading my book about joy. Um, the story uh, that came to my mind was a story that Jesus told. It's often a story that... Uh, that guides my thinking, and it came to mind because of a particular moment within it. It's the prodigal son story. You know the story. The father um, welcomes back the prodigal. There's a great celebration of joy. Um, he's wasted all the money and the inheritance, but he's welcomed back into the home. And uh, 
what I got to thinking about was the older son's reaction. That's, a, that's an interesting one to focus on in that story, how the older son reacts. He's just not pleased. He may have a little bit of schadenfreude going on. He's, uh, he's hoping that the, the, the younger brother's going to mess up so bad that he can take joy in it, but instead he's messed up so bad and then the father welcomes him home. So he's, he's not uh, pleased with this. He says to the father, for years I've worked for you, I've slaved away for you, I've always obeyed you but you have never given me a little goat to celebrate with my friends so I could have dinner with them. See he's he's kind of hedging the idea that he's got some schadenfreude going on there. He, that's what he was hoping for. But here's what the father says to the older son. Catch these words. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he's come to life. He was lost and has been found. We had to celebrate and rejoice. I'm reminded in this story that I'm called to center on the joy of the Father, to be like the Father in expressing joy. Not in the whining of the older son, but in the expression of rejoicing that the Father has. I can't center my rejoicing on the misfortunes of others. I can't rely on that as an internal source for a grounded kind of joy. Instead, I've got to cultivate compassion, and therefore, I will experience joy. So today, my friends, I rejoice. I rejoice in many, many ways. I rejoice in my family, of course, not just uh, Karen and Ethan, but uh, even that uncle and my cousin, you know, that I have to deal with during the holiday season. I even rejoice in them, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to be with them and to gather with them. I rejoice in the beauty of living right here in Iowa with all of you. Some days I'll look up in the sky and I'll see those planes flying over. And you know they refer to us, along with the Midwest, as the flyover state. And I, I take joy in that. Go ahead, fly east and west. And, and uh, I'll experience the beauty right here in, uh, in Iowa. The beauty that is uh, walking in Lake McBride on a, on a glorious uh, fall uh, afternoon or evening and and I see the recent sunsets that we've had and I think about how I rejoice in living right here in the middle with all of you and I rejoice in that and I rejoice in being in ministry with all of you at Solon United Methodist Church the way that you've responded with your time and talents and treasures uh, throughout the year this year and uh, and for the five years that I've been among you I, I extend and experience uh, the mission of the church continuing to work together that we might welcome newcomers and connect with God's abiding love and, and with our Christian character that it might be ignited and be able to impact the world around us in positive ways. I relish seeing each of you find your spiritual gift and serve through those gifts in our world. Friends, may you and I rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. So be it and may it be so.